Hello, and welcome to season four of Baltimore Pioneers, coming to you from the historic Parkway Theater in Baltimore, the new home for this show. As always, we are here to talk with compelling thinkers and doers in Baltimore. I'm Xavier Plater. Thanks for tuning in to the Student Produce Show. Our guest in this premiere episode is Adam Jackson, CEO from Leaders of a Beautiful Struggle and director of the Eddie Conway Liberation Institute. Mr. Jackson graduated from Towson University with a degree in social justice and is a West Baltimore native. His organizations connect young people to advocacy and helps them drive change in communities throughout the city. So Mr. Jackson, how are you? Good, good, good to be here. It's a pleasure of having you. So can you tell me a little bit about your Baltimore and what, how do you feel in the community these days? Um, in terms of just the city, generally speaking? Yes. Um, well, one of the things that has happened since the uh, 2015 uh, Baltimore uprising mm -hmm. after the murder of Freddie Gray is that there's a lot of increased conversation around how do we really create justice within our communities, particularly the black community. And something that's kind of arisen as a result is that more people are talking about investment in black organizations, black institutions, and how we can be drivers of uh, transformative change in our own communities so that we can destruct. Uh, structural racism, structural white supremacy. And so in many ways, I think my Baltimore is one where there are black people working in community with institutions and organizations that are working on behalf of their community without uh, the need of other outsiders to come in to do that. And so um, I've seen, and you know, it's taken me a long time to see that, but I think the uprising kind of shed things, shed light on a lot of those things. And I feel like now we're at a place where we can really have some transformative change in Baltimore if we really put the time and work in. So you speak about like the uprising. So tell me about how is it growing in Baltimore City and how is it different now? Well, I mean, the, well, you know, people speak about the uprising. They talk about those two days in April mm -hmm. uh, where there was, well, that, that, well, I guess two days, yeah, two days in April where there was uh, those, uh, the students at Bon Domme Mall who were um, attacked by police. And then uh, that, fought that evening in uh, Penn North where there was, uh, you know, the CBS burned down. So when people talk about the uprising, mm -hmm. you know, that's what people are talking about. But the uprising in general, in terms of those, those actions specifically, that I think a lot of Baltimore residents woke up. And I think a lot of people were now focused on, you know, there's all these structural things that led us to this point. And it all just kind of culminated in the death of Freddie Gray. Mm -hmm. But I feel like what that did is that it shed light on why people like Freddie Gray are incarcerated and arrested and don't have access to the resources that they need. Because a question people ask all the time now is, you know, if Freddie Gray was like our, our neighbor, yeah. would we have given him any support or resources? And the answer most of the time is no. We just, we walk by Freddie Gray's every day, but because we don't see them as necessary assets to our community, that we don't invest in them. And, not, and we meaning the society writ large. And so I think that now we need to f figure out what can we do to transform the lives of our own people and our own community without waiting on the government or nonprofits from uh, other places to do it. Wow, that's, that's true, that's absolutely amazing. Um, so when it comes to you being a youth, what were some of the historical figures that you looked up to and why? When I was younger, um, well, it's interesting because I actually went through a transformation in my college years because I attended Towson University. And when I first got to that school, I was tremendously conservative. Um, actually, ironically, my, both of my parents had about 30 years of peace uh, experience in law enforcement. Mm -hmm. So I grew up in a household where, you know, we knew law enforcement. You know, I wasn't really scared to talk to the police. I wasn't really scared of law enforcement growing up. But I think what happened for me is that as I got older, you know, because I got, my, well, the other thing was because I, because I grew up in a house where I was around that environment, you know, I didn't really come to hate the police when I was younger. So I didn't really, you know, so a lot of my um, people I looked up to were people like my dad, you know, people in my life who I thought were, um, you know, I saw as like disciplined and had integrity. So he's who I looked up to. But when I got older, when I learned more about my history and myself, I, I grew to look up to people like, in addition to my father, people like Malcolm X and Marcus Garvey and Elijah Muhammad, you know, black men in particular who uh, were fighting for freedom and liberation for black people. Mm -hmm. And so I think that transition happened mostly because of the awakening I had at Towson, because Towson's a majority white uh, university. Yeah. And um, most black people who go there will tell you, uh, you know, mm -hmm. don't have uh, too many savory experiences that they like, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, at Towson. But I think um, that was my first time being around white people, mm -hmm. really. And yeah. so, yeah, because in, in Baltimore City Public Schools, I, about 99% of all the students I interacted with were black. And I never really yeah. interacted with white folks. Mm -hmm. And so I think at the time it was, you know, I didn't understand racism as a system. I understood it as white individuals 
who were doing racist actions, but not as a system that conspires to, you know, destroy our communities. So I think when I got to college, I had those like great black heroes and sheroes. Mm -hmm. But younger, I mostly looked up to my my father and the people in my, my the men in my immediate life who were around me. That's beautiful. So can you talk to us about your experience through Towson and what had you, you know, what made you start at LBS and what motivated you in that process? So just kind of starting in high school. So I was a policy debater for about eight years total. So I was four years in high school, four years in college. Mm -hmm. um, I debated in the local debate league here in Baltimore, but uh, I didn't really receive all the benefits of it because I didn't really get a chance to travel nationally or you know, do a lot of the um, competition that a lot of white schools and white Catholic schools get when they debate. And so when I got to college, I actually got a scholarship to go to Towson University for policy debate to be on their debate team. And so when I went to Towson, um, I think that's what basically set me apart in terms of um, my intellectual um, preparation for the work I do now. Because uh, our team is probably, I mean, at the time, I think we were like the best team of black debaters in the country. And in terms of the last eight debate champions, I believe, that were black in the United States, six of them came from Baltimore. And all of them are people that, if they weren't us, they were people we trained or coached. Mm -hmm. And so I think that kind of set the stage for what we do at LBS because besides debate, we also were involved in organizing work on campus through the Black Student Union, a group called the Brotherhood that I ran when I was at Towson. And so um, when we were doing that, um, we, were, we just saw it as preparation, intellectual preparation for the um, work we wanted to do in Baltimore. Right. And so when we finished, we were like, let's create an institution in Baltimore that advocates for black people. Mm. And because we were policy debaters, we figured the best thing to do is to become a think tank because think tanks focus on policy. <laughs> okay. So we were like, let's become a think tank and we've been doing that since 2010. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, your college experiences are phenomenal, man. So we're gonna take a quick break from our conversation with Adam Jackson, we'll be right back. A lot of exciting things are happening each and every day in Baltimore City Public Schools. Our students are learning, excelling, growing, and achieving as they prepare for college and careers. You can see our students in action and the work they're producing right here on Education Channel 77 and online. If you'd like to watch more stories on the exciting things our students are doing in Baltimore City Public Schools, please visit www.vimeo.com slash city schools. I'm a first generation college student, so there wasn't much help from like my, from home with the process. Like they encouraged me, but they didn't really know how to go about the process. So I worked here at North Avenue last year as student congress president, and I received a mentor, Dr. Jessup, who works here, and she helped me with the college process. Her and her husband. If I didn't have her, then it would have been way harder than what it was. Modernizing school buildings for Baltimore City students has begun, like right here at Arundel Elementary School. Amazing new spaces to learn in. Yes, through this program, schools and communities are being brought together in a brand new way. And I'm so proud to be part of this effort. That's right. Construction jobs are open and internships are available. Discover more about the program at www.baltimore21stcenturyschools.org. Building a brighter, brighter future together. together. Welcome back to Baltimore Pioneers, coming to you from the historic Parkway Theater in Baltimore. I'm Xavier Plater, here with Adam Jackson, CEO from Leaders of a Beautiful Struggle. So Adam, in my research of Leaders of a Beautiful Struggle, you guys consider yourselves as grassroots think tanks, correct? Mm -hmm. So can you tell me why do you consider yourself as one? Part of the reason we decided to become a think tank is because we just looked at what think tanks do and their relationship to policy debate. If you go to college right now and become a policy debater, and let's say you win, if you're the top speaker at the national debate tournament in college, you get an internship to the Center for Strategic International Studies. And if you look at other think tanks like it, like the Heritage Foundation and other think tanks like it, their goal is to drive public policy. And in policy debate, what we saw was that a lot of the white folks uh, who went to you know, top tier research institutions like Wake Forest and Harvard, they would leave debate and become lawyers and uh, they would run think tanks, they would become lobbyists. And so we were like, we just, we didn't need, we just need to create the black version of that. Mm -hmm. And so uh, what do we do and how do we do that in Baltimore at a local level? Because those organizations are national. But we were like, well, what's the policy arm of the community in Baltimore? Mm -hmm. And so we figured that becoming a grassroots think tank, that just means that you gotta, be, you gotta focus on the particular issues that advances the interests of us and black folks here in Baltimore. And we just decided to become that. 
And so we were filling a void that we saw as a, as that didn't exist in Baltimore. And we see that as our lane, like policy is our lane. We do a bunch of different things, but policy advocacy is our lane because we think that that's what our community needs to make sure that lawmakers and our legislators are working in our interests. So being in Baltimore, how is your environment affecting the way you think? I mean, the, the thing is, when I, I remember before, there was a difference between how I saw Baltimore and how I see it now. Mm -hmm. You know, when you grow up in a city like Baltimore, there's no explicit education or explicit understanding about how Baltimore got to where it got. Mm -hmm. You just see, uh, you see Baltimore from a deficit model. You see vacant homes, you, the school systems are in, disrespa in disrepair, mm -hmm. you know, um, people, you only, see, you only see the murder rate. Like those are the things you see and pay attention to mm -hmm. because we've internalized anti-blackness and internalized uh, self-hatred about uh, not just ourselves, but the city we live in. And I think that that's a mistake because when you see it from an asset-based perspective, when you look at the way the city uh, works and you see all the people that, are, that love it so much, you stop seeing watered up homes and you see opportunities to build up communities and to really help them thrive and to help people get themselves out of the condition that they're in. But I think that not seeing it that way initially, it hurt my ability to really empower myself to change the conditions around me. And so right now, I, in terms of where I, who I surround myself with, I surround myself with black people that run institutions, run organizations, and have programs that address the material conditions of black people. So it affects my psychology in terms of how I see Baltimore. So I don't see all the things that you know the news media likes to report on. I much rather focus on the black people in community that don't have the platforms, don't get all the Twitter followers, and how do we empower and give them the resources to change black people's conditions. Okay. So as you know, history is repeating itself every single day and every single year. Can you tell me from your research and from your knowledge of history, how does it affect the way you lead your organization? History is everything. I mean, without history, you really can't change anything in present, in present time. And I think a good example of that, um, you know, has happened recently with the youth fund, because people are talking about the Baltimore City Children and Youth Fund. Mm -hmm. And, you know, part of that, because it's $12 million that the that voters approved last year mm -hmm. uh, that, and to, to go to uh, programs that serve children and youth. And that's public money, essentially, that, are, that, that I see as an opportunity to invest in community-based institutions and organizations. But what most people don't know about Baltimore is if you go back to the mid-1800s and you saw black people in Baltimore who were doing the same kind of work in terms of looking for public money and public investment in black schools. Because at the time, black people could not attend white schools and the school they did attend, we had to create. Right. And so, but we were paying tax money to attend school. And so their perspective back then was, well, how do we, so either we're gonna stop paying taxes for school or we can use that money to invest in our community so we can have better schools for ourselves. But, that, but the thing is, if you compare and contrast, it's the same exact struggle. It's just that people see them as different because they're not connecting the dots. And so there's all these places throughout history, in Baltimore in particular, where it's essential that we have that historical lens. Because without it, you won't know people's names like Perry Mitchell or Walter Carter mm -hmm. or these black people that have been advocating on our, on our community's behalf for so many years, but they're gone. And so people just forget them and they don't know them. But I think without that history, it's impossible to say you are working for transformative change because those are the people who set the standard and set the bar. Right. So basically you're saying that it, history is inevitable. It's always going to change, but we as individuals are the only ones to make a change in ourselves. Yeah, I mean, pe yeah, people, yeah, people should be focusing on how they can look to the past and use it as a resource. It's not merely a flashpoint. Right. Like people just see it as a reference, not a resource. So if you're able to see it as a resource, then you can see how people have already been doing these different versions of what, we, what we're claiming is new. Like none of this stuff is brand new. None of the things I do is brand new. It's just a new, a new iteration of what people who, are, of people who are smarter than me have already created several years ago. And I'm just the newest flavor of it <laughs> on the block. Yeah. Okay, so let's take another quick break. And as we come back, we'll try to dig deeper into the issues. Stay tuned. Modernizing school buildings for Baltimore City students has begun like right here at Arundel Elementary School. Amazing new spaces to learn in. Yes, through this program, schools and communities are being brought together in a brand new way. And I'm so proud to be part of this effort. That's right. Construction jobs are open and internships are available. Discover more about the program at www.baltimore21stcenturyschools.org. Building a brighter future together. 
These are our future, engineers and electricians, software designers and doctors, construction workers and child care providers. They will build apps and houses, create menus and video games, work with cutting edge technology and kids. They'll be found in classrooms and courtrooms, construction sites and computer labs. They are Baltimore City Public School students. They are career and technology education. Welcome back to Baltimore Pioneers. I'm Xavier Plater, here with Adam Jackson, CEO from Leaders of a Beautiful Struggle, a man looking to make a difference every day in this city. Thanks for tuning in. So Adam, we're gonna go more deeper into the youth in this community. What is the number one problem that youth face in Baltimore? The number one problem is that there is not enough investment in their future uh -huh. by the institutions that claim to serve them. And a lot of the time when people think that they're serving youth, like people think serving youth means you have a program where you feed somebody mm -hmm. and you know, they go, they go to a center after school, like that's, but that's not really serving youth because ultimately those are just stop gaps. You know, right. because if you cannot, if you don't have access to the institutions mm -hmm. that are gonna help you live a quality life, then ultimately those institutions will fail you in the long term. Mm -hmm. Because I know for me, part of the reason that I'm able to get where I got is because my family made sure that they invested in me and found programs and found things that I could be in, but also wrapped around me a whole support network of people that made me into a success, you know, relative to my peers. Mm -hmm. Because when I look at myself, I know that the people that, um, that have fallen short or maybe have not gotten as far as they would like to in life that are my peer group, right. a lot of them just, they don't have the kinds of institutions in their communities that can invest in them directly in terms of like getting them, uh, not, just, not just good grades, but like how do you help people find direction and paths in life that will help them come into their fullness. But I think that's, what, that's the problem in Baltimore. And there are, assist, there are organizations and institutions that are, suff that are uh, profiting off of the suffering of our young people. And so people are getting six figure salaries to say that they you know, are teaching young people after school or having programs, but at the end of the day, these people aren't really making any effective impact on our people. And, and in terms of who controls it, they aren't from Baltimore and they don't, they're not really invested in Baltimore. They're invested in getting paid and getting grant money, mm -hmm. but those people, they're failing our young people. And that's the real criminal thing about what's happening in Baltimore. It's not the young people's fault that there's no access to proper resources. Mm -hmm. It's the adult's fault, particularly the adults that say that they're, they're serving young people but not really doing it at a high quality level. Mm -hmm. And just to add on what you say, in this spectrum, media is one of the, the mainstreams that's going out everywhere. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people like to do things in front of the media, like to do things in front of the camera just mm -hmm. to show mm -hmm. their little distribution of giving back to the hood or to the communities or to mm -hmm. the youth. Just a facade, I'd say. Um, so, and Baltimore as a whole, and this community, and this society, um, actually, why do you think that individuals hate people who love them mm. and love the people that hate them more? People have internalized self-hatred, you know, particularly black people. You look at the history of racism and white supremacy in the United States, mm. and you look at the way that uh, the enslavement of African people through Ma the Ma'afa, the, you know, the Middle Passage, all those experiences that African people have faced have taught us to hate ourselves and taught us to have internalized self-hatred. Mm -hmm. So that's the, that's the short answer, but the long answer in terms of how, why do people like, love the people that hate them and vice versa, mm -hmm. like those dynamics are mired in how institutions are set up. Like people will vote for the same elected official even though, they'll vote for Democrats every year in Baltimore, even though that the, the, those folks haven't really served the black community in any substantive way. They'll come on TV and tell you they will. They say that they'll vote for certain policies or advance certain ideas, but at the end of the day, they just see the black, black people's vote for them. They take it for granted, you know? And black people don't really spend the time organizing outside of the Democratic Party to get what we need from those kinds of folks. And it's not just the political establishment, it's the uh, nonprofit sector, the business sector. There are so many people around us that have given us such good lip service and rhetoric that is say they want, they serve our interests as a people, but ultimately, when you peel back the cover and you look at where the money goes, who's invested in what, uh, what initiatives succeeding, mm -hmm. things like Port Covington that don't benefit our community and all these other things, mm -hmm. you know, these are the things that people are invested in, in terms of making sure that, <clears throat> that their interests can be forwarded. But when you, but people don't know the difference. And part of it is, is just highlighting uh, when uh, people's interests are actually, um, when people aren't being at, when the people's interest is not at stake when they're talking about these other people right. that claim the service at right. the end of the day. Right, so when we talk about claiming service, what is, let's go deep, what is your main definition of racial discrimination in Baltimore City? 
Well, if you talk, well, you can start at white supremacy and the areas of white supremacy that, uh, or the areas of civil society, rather, that white supremacy impacts, you know, labor, law, politics, sex, religion, war, all these other areas that affect in society, if you just bring that down to Baltimore, <laughs> all of those things are true. You know, when you look at every area of civil society right. and how black people, the outcomes for black people in each of these different areas, you'll see that black people are almost always on the bottom. And so when people are talking about racial discrimination or how uh, race impacts our ability to serve black people, that's what always comes up. And you always see that we're always on the bottom. So the question is, how do we get there and how do we eradicate the systems that brought us here? And so I, feel, I see it as my job to fix that, to, to do that, particularly in the area of policy, because the people don't want to deal with those, wrestle with those questions, because it's easy to start with so-and-so called me the N-word, mm -hmm. as opposed to the structures and the systems that justify structural oppression of black people. So let's take our last break for this episode. And when Baltimore Pioneers returns, Mr. Jackson and I will discuss solutions. We'll be right back. School cafeterias have been making some changes. Whole grains, whole milk, fresh fruits and vegetables, some of them delivered from the district's own farm, and it's all free. Every city school student can now eat breakfast and lunch free every day. It's been good so far. Because it's like they gave me a choice, and I like having a choice. Now that's something to snack on. I am a Baltimore City Public School student. I'm a lot of Baltimore City Public School. I'm a doctor in Baltimore City. Salut, je suis une élève de Baltimore City Public School. So I'm a student of Baltimore City Public Schools. I'm a student of Baltimore City Public Schools. I'm a student of Baltimore City we are Baltimore City Public School students. And we celebrate diversity every day. Work is underway on modernizing school buildings, like here at Fort Worthington Elementary Middle School. The type of school buildings we deserve. Our new schools will provide community-friendly spaces and be better for our environment. They will allow for innovative technology and 21st century teaching and learning. The 21st Century School Buildings Program is positively affecting my education and my city. That's right. Learn more about this major commitment from the state, city of Baltimore, and city schools by visiting baltimore21stcenturyschools.org. Building a brighter future together. Welcome back to Baltimore Pioneers, recording at the beautifully restored Parkway Theater in the Station North Arts District in Baltimore. I'm Xavier Plater, here with Adam Jackson, CEO from Leaders of a Beautiful Struggle, talking about the real issues in Baltimore. So Adam, there is a $12 million youth fund that's going on for children all ages from, I guess, adolescence to teenage. Um, you talk about Let's Invest in Baltimore City and you know, black-led organizations. Which one do you invest in more and why? I mean, there's lots of different ones. Um, the ones I talk about the most, um, there's a sister named Shauna Murray Brown mm -hmm. who runs uh, an organization called Kindred Wellness. She's a licensed social worker and Yoruba priestess, but a lot of her work is with black women and girls. Mm -hmm. And the reason why I support her stuff particularly is because she supports um, a frame around black people, like in terms of like healing and wellness, like that's a thing that in Baltimore, particularly black people, like we don't really have an opportunity to heal from the traumas that we've experienced. Right. And we typically don't have black people that are experts in those areas. And so I support Shauna's work because I think we should have more black people in the human and social services sector who have our perspective as African people and mm -hmm. can help us heal from trauma. Um, there's people like uh, Marissa Stone Bass uh, from The Living Well. And they essentially what they do is they provide space an opportunity for local organizations and institutions and leaders to grow. I think they call it um, conscious expansion uh, at the Living Well. Okay. You know, we work with them a bunch, um, and we and I support their work. And there's a bunch of other people like Bob, Bobby Marvin Holmes, Sadiq mm -hmm. Ali. Um, you know, there's too many to name. You know, there's so many, there's so many, there's dozens and dozens of brothers and sisters who are doing the work with young people that need support, need upliftment. And I think the fund uh, should be a part of helping them build capacity to make their work more effective and more transformative. So what are the major areas in Baltimore City that needs more improvement? And how, what could be done to fix it? I mean, the main thing is we need to figure out how to invest more money in institutions that haven't typically gotten resources and giving, our, and giving black people the ability to define our own destiny on our own terms. Because mm -hmm. one of the more foundational problems is 
you know, besides race, like besides racism as a general issue, we don't really have the opportunity to leave. Like we should be able to stay in our communities and have all the institutions and resources we need before we leave out. So you should have proper schooling, health, um, you know, access to food, like all the things that healthy, vibrant communities have, we should have access to in our communities. And the institutions that serve us should be controlled by us, not the government and not nonprofits that aren't in our, not, that aren't indigenous to us. So to me, that's a more, that's a structural issue, is that how do we get more investment in our community-led groups so that way we can empower ourselves to transform our condition. And that is a pro, that's an issue that people aren't willing to look at because if we look at who's getting money and resources, mm -hmm. we'll see who's actually Who's, who's at the top of the civil society and that those folks have not typically invested in our communities. And so to me, the solution is just getting more money into the hands of people in Baltimore who do work on behalf of residents. So within Baltimore, how can the youth impact the community? I mean, there's multiple ways. I think that part, one, of the, one, of the, one of the main things that I think young people should do mm -hmm. is to follow the leadership of elders and get tutelage and instruction from, el from elders because one of the shortfalls that our generation has a lot of the time is that we see elders as in the way or people that, um, that are uh, outdated or that they don't, we don't need to listen. In reality, we really need to have the kind of, uh, we need to be poured into as, young, as younger people, because I'm only 29, but there's younger people than me who, you know, who think that they're revolutionaries and think they're about to change the world around them when they're not even talking to the people who've been through this uh, rodeo before. Like, we were, we're going through Donald Trump, but they lived through Ronald Reagan. They lived through the crack era. And no one's talking to our parents and to our, and to our grandparents about the struggles that they saw growing up in the civil rights movement throughout the 80s and 90s. And I think that we, the young people need to get more connected with elders in our community because that, then that's gonna help them be transformative in the community around them. Because what happens is we think we're the newest thing smoking and that we're the ones with all the answers. Mm -hmm. When in reality, this has been, these have been the same issues that have been plaguing our people for at least two or three centuries. So we should be figuring out how to transform our condition by just following the, uh, the, the resource of the past and our history to move to the future. So when you speak about youth connecting to elders with history and knowledge, how can we get these youth, how can we get the individuals to this resource? I know we got media, we got technology, but sometimes you may need the actual person to be in front of you to tell you a little bit about the world you live in. So how can we make that connection? Well, I know for me, I had to seek out my elders. And, you know, of course, you would like it for your elders to be available to you on a silver platter, because that's how it should be. Your elders should find you and invest in you. Mm -hmm. But sometimes it's difficult to do that because there's so many material forces that keep our elders separate from our young people. So for me, I had to make an intentional effort to, to seek out uh, my elders and figure out who I wanted to get investment from because there's people um you know there's people in baltimore that you there, there's like world-class people here that no one knows exists you know that they'll they'll go to their graves and even though they've they've done world-class things on behalf of uh, baltimore residents you'll never know who they are but so i so i always find it incumbent on us to seek out our elders and to try to fix that problem by connecting with youth on a daily basis and investing in them because to me without a pipeline of leadership it's all for naught because who cares how great you are and excellent that you are if you don't seek out youth and young adults to invest in and to pour into. Right. So, Mr. Jackson, what are your hopes for the Baltimore community now? My hope is that, that, there are, that we can transform the material conditions of people who are suffering and not in the abstract way. Like, you know, people talk about that real abstractly. Like, I want to make sure that people, more kids are getting a quality education, or I want more kids to have access to opportunity, or I want people to stop being addicted to drugs. Mm -hmm. When in reality, all those things, like, even though in, by themselves they're good, we should be working to transform the systems and the structure that impair our ability to live a full life as human beings in this country and around the world. And so my hope for Baltimore is that we are, cropping, we are creating the next crop of young leaders who are going to help do, the, do that with us and for us in the future. In the end, as long as we work together, history will change and the system will change as well. Well, this brings us to the end of Baltimore Pioneers. Once again, I appreciate you so much for coming out here and sharing your knowledge. And I'd like to thank you for watching Baltimore Pioneers, a program where we talk with thinkers and doers in Baltimore. This show is produced by the City School Student Media Team and is brought to you by the Proximity Project and Educational Channel 77 of Baltimore City Public Schools. And a special shout out to the Parkway Theater for being our new home for the show. And if you haven't come down here to see a movie, you better check this place out. It's amazing. So this has been Baltimore Pioneers. I'm Xavier Plater. See you next time.
Bye, man. Bye, man.